I'm Peter Murray Rust. I'm going to tell you about a project I'm starting called The Content Mine. This project uh, is to liberate a hundred million facts from the scientific literature uh, using both humans and machines and to make them available to the world uh, for the benefit of everybody. And I'm going to explain how we're going to do it, what we're going to do, why we're going to do it and who we're going to do it with. Tim Berners-Lee developed the World Wide Web 20 years ago to share scientific information. Here's an example. We know that CO2 is increasing, but by numerical analysis we can actually see that the world is breathing carbon dioxide each year. Publishers try and stop us data mining, but they have no legal basis. And in the OKF, we have asserted that the right to read is the right to mine. Okay, this is a system we've developed over 20 years. It uses many modern methods of program construction and it's got literally thousands of routines. And it converts dumb PDF uh, into semantic material and then into actual science. And we'll see now how it can be deployed. We really can turn PDFs into science. Here's a bit of really dense text which most humans would run away from. But machines can extract all the facts in that and here you can see how they've located the place where the experiment took place. Here's some chemistry. This is even more turgid. But our chemical tagger can read all the facts in it and here we can see the phrase about heating the reaction. Here about dissolving things in other things. And here we can see how we can pull out chemicals and actually interpret their structures on the fly. And so here is the complete analysis of the paragraph with every fact extracted. We can also do that with graphs. Here's a graph. Look at the blue graph here. Zoom in on it. And now we can see the axes, the scales, uh, and there are actually 2,000 data points. We extract them into a CSV file and then we can do numerical analysis uh, like second derivatives. I really enjoyed your course on software carpentry and the way you delivered it will change the way that I tackle programs. Now I'm thinking of doing the same sort of thing for data. How do you think I should proceed? Well, I think there's three steps. Number one, you have to go and teach a couple of times yourself to find out what the audience will listen to. Because one of the biggest mistakes we made in the early days of software carpentry was teaching what we thought was important rather than what scientists are ready to receive. Second thing you have to do is start identifying the people that you're teaching that you can then turn into instructors. It's never worked well for us to have professional software developers try to teach these skills to scientists. And I think the third thing you have to do is the same thing that every open project has to do. You have to create a space that is, that is welcoming, that is uh, respectful, uh, a place where people feel that even if they only know a little, even if they've only got a little to contribute today, they will be welcomed and they will be helped. If you've got those three things, I think it'll grow beyond what you yourself could do on your own. The question now is, how do you start on task number one? So I talked to two Shuttleworth fellows and also visited Daniel's session on crowdcrafting. Our Panton fellows love running hackfests and so does Foxy. Putting it together, community, events, library and repositories, publishers and companies. So, we're looking for collaborators, particularly those who like running events and boot camps and hack camps. Uh, I'm going to be spending a lot of time learning how to do this with software carpentry and becoming an instructor. And we're looking for people who come to our camps, uh, get so excited that they want to go off and do the same thing themselves.